Your Excellencies and Honorable Guests, um, I welcome you to um, take your seat. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Um, today, we, uh, today uh, we are here at the Center for Strategic and International Studies uh, at the CSIL, CSIS Lecture Series on Regional Dynamics. We are honored and privileged to have this morning discussion on Japanese perspective for security in Asia with uh, Mr. Hitoshi Tanaka, Chairman, Institute for International Strategy, the Japan Research Institute Limited, as well as former Deputy Minister for Foreign Affairs of Japan. Um, today, uh, the moderator will be CSIS founder, Mr. Yusuf Wanandi, um, and I would like to uh, welcome Mr. Yusuf Wanandi to come to the stage to introduce Mr. Hitoshi Tanaka. Please. Good morning, everybody. I, on behalf of CSIS, would like to welcome you all, and particularly our guest speaker, for today, the topic being, as you can see, a Japanese perspective for security in Asia. I think it's timely that we hear, you know, from a scholar and a practitioner from Japan on the perspective of Japan's, of the future of Asia. Because anyhow, especially East Asia, of course, because anyhow, Japan is a big country, it's a big partner, uh, of ASEAN and of Indonesia particularly, and I'm very glad to be able to moderate uh, Tanaka-san to come and, 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 and moderate his speech or his presentation to you. I have known him for 20 years at least, when he was uh, a, a, a well-known diplomat and a very, uh, uh, you know, has a very actually uh, the illustrious career in Japan's foreign ministry, where he was then last as deputy minister, foreign minister of Japan. And he was very much instrumental under Prime Minister Koizumi in many, many events and achievements of Japan during that period. I'm very glad when he was JCIE, the Inter International Exchange, you know, uh, actually NGO and a think tank under a common friend, you know, Mr. Tadashi Yamamoto, the, the late Tadashi Yamamoto, that we have been able to cooperate much more closely after he, he left the foreign ministry and joined the think tank. And, 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 and as you can see, he still is very active and last a few years ago, we have actually uh, with uh, Mr. T Tanaka uh, joined, jointly produced several books on cooperation of Japan and ASEAN particularly. And that was a very, I think, important as well as a very fruitful uh, ex uh, uh, cooperation that we have done lastly. Hopefully, we were just talking, you know, uh, before, before coming here uh, about, about the future cooperation we rather would like to establish and, and see the importance of. So, Mr. Tanaka has been well known for his views and we have enjoyed many of his views and exchange ideas about them. And I'm looking forward again, not only to hear Mr. Tanaka this morning, but also uh, uh, hopefully having him more often to come and, and, and have a real cooperation to be established. Thank you, uh, Tanaka-san, for coming. And may I now introduce you to come upstairs. Well, thank you. Very of course, you know, to be able to moderate this conference. And I, I know I have to do something about this. 
And I would like to now uh, invite, you know, uh, Ambassador Tanaka to give his thoughts on the security developments in this part of the world. And, I, and, and, and then I think after 10, 15 minutes, we would like you to have an exchange and a dialogue, you know, with uh, Ambassador Tanaka. May I now give you the, the floor or standing or sitting, whatever. Give him a big hand. Uh, I thank you very much, yes, Yusuf. Uh, you said that you knew me for the past 20 years, but I know him for the past 45 years. When I was a junior uh, embassy officer in 1972, I came all the way from London uh, when I graduated from Oxford University, then arrived here, and Yusuf was, at that time, already established figure. Therefore, I went around with my ambassador to meet him that 45 years ago. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah, it is a great pleasure for me to have known Yusuf for the past 40 year, 45 years, and I often come across him in various uh, international uh, seminars, the Trilateral Commission meeting, Japan ASEAN context, and all sorts of things. And I myself, uh, being uh, the, uh, uh, the person in charge of uh, ASEAN, and also in charge of uh, Asia as a whole, uh, my uh, diplomatic career is very much to do with the uh, region of Asia. Uh, so uh, today, I would like to make a short uh, introduction about how we feel about the current affairs, uh, particularly in East Asia. Uh, t I think two weeks ago I was in Europe, uh, going around various countries in Europe, the, starting from Brussels, Paris, and Denmark, uh, and Hungary. Uh, sort of trying to uh, sense how they look at the situation in Asia, in particular the confrontation between China and the United States and how they feel about the uh, international order. And this time in Asia I visited the Philippines, uh, Thailand, and here. Again, sort of trying to get their feeling about the uh, current rivalry between Japan, not Japan, uh, United States and China. And surprisingly, the views are different. There are variety of views seeing this current affairs. A couple of angles they have. One is that United States is no longer the US in the past. United States under the Trump administration themselves are undermining their leadership because President Trump says America first, which does mean that they may prefer short-term interest of America, not necessarily longer-term interest of the United States. For instance, when President Trump came to Japan, uh, in the press conference, he said that the U.S.-Japan security treaty is not fair. It's not fair because the uh, United States has an ob obligation to defend Japan, but Japan doesn't have an obligation to defend the United States. It's not fair, is it? It's not fair. But this type of arrangement was concluded because of various elements, in particular, question of the past. Nobody can deny that Japan was an aggressor before the war. And when Japan was rebuffed, Japan after the end of the World War, we introduced peace treaty. And under the peace treaty, we sort of confined our role, military role, as purely defensive. 
fairly defensive. Therefore, there was no way for us to be an equal partner to the U.S., you know, defending U.S. in their territory. Therefore, this U.S. Japan Security Treaty is unbalanced. The United States has an obligation to defend Japan, but Japan doesn't have an obligation to defend the United States beyond the Japanese territory. Instead, Japan promised to provide base facilities to the U.S., and United States utilizing those base facilities for the defense of various other countries, not necessarily only, only Japan, Korea, Taiwan, and for that matter, I mean, <laughs> you remember that when they, America fought a Vietnam War, major portion of soldiers went from the Japanese base facility. And when they fought Iraq war, the Japanese base facilities were in substance utilized. So this is a kind of reciprocity. We provide base facilities, base facility United States uses for the sake of international peace in wider area. Uh, United States considered it its long-term interest because Japan is a uh, developed country. Japan is a very stable country. Therefore, it's their interest, they thought, to have their soldiers stationed in Japan. That's a long-term interest. This forward deployment concept is based upon long-term interest of the United States. Now Trump is saying that it's unfair. It doesn't serve the short-term interest of the United States. Therefore, something needs to be done in relation to, I'm not entirely sure if he is serious about it. He may be using it for the sake of getting better deal from Japan in terms of bilateral trade, as they did vis-a-vis -vis China. But yet, the key question is, United States is getting more and more unpredictable. And to the end of the day, there might be untrustworthy. This is a serious question. This is a serious question we have to think in the whole sort of regional and also international global stability as well. China is rising. No question about it. China is rising not just in economic scale. When I was director in charge of uh, our trade with the United States in 19, eight, late 1980s, 1986-7. I concluded 26 treaties, uh, you know, the opening, the uh, market opening up measures, like Chinese do today. Uh, at that time, the United States occupied about 30% of total trade of Japan. Today, it's reduced to 15%. China rose from 6% to 25%. And if you look at the uh, visiting foreign tourists, out of 30 million people who visited Japan last year, 25% Chinese, 25% Taiwanese and Hongkongese. Surprising. We are so interdependent. Therefore, we have to be very careful about how China will you know, develop themselves. Very, very short period of time. Uh, China surpassed Japan in terms of GDP in 2010, uh, almost 10 years. China today is almost three times as big as Japan. And China has come to 60% of GDP of the United States. When Japan became 60% of GDP, of United States, Japan was bashing Japan. Japan is unique. Japan may be surpassing the United States. They are very serious. Same thing happening. But yet, different, different thing is, uh, in the 80s, late, uh, the early 90s, and today, Japan is an ally with the United States. But China is not. China runs different type of governance. We have every reason to be worried about the future of China. And again, there are signs which show how, you know, which shows China might be pursuing 
a kind of hegemon in the region. If you look at the speed of their military capability build up, South China Sea, East China Sea, and if you look at their attitude vis-a-vis -vis Southeast Asia, vis-a-vis -vis Japan, vis-a-vis -vis Korea, for instance, China does not mind using economic method to force others to change their view. With the Philippines, they stop importation of bananas. With uh, South Korea, they stopped the various act economic activities with them. So we are worried about it. And again, America, I think two years ago, and last year as well, thought that China now is a real entity which may threaten the United States in short period of time. They saw it from the Xi Jinping's decision to get rid of his term as president of China. So theoretically speaking, he can be the president of China almost forever. And China talks about China dream. China dream is consisted of certain things like China becoming the largest socialist nation in the world, which may be surpassing the United States in terms of scale, economic scale. This is a reality. This is a reality. So again, what I'm talking about is in this region of East Asia, in this region of East Asia, if you look back the history, Japan was a rising power. 40, 450 years ago, Japan sent troops to Korean Peninsula. I mean, I, talk, I will talk about Korea uh, shortly, momentarily, but yet Japan did fight wars, three or four wars in the region. And the first major war Japan fought was Japan-China War in 1894. It even fought, I mean, just 40 years after uh, Commodore Perry came to Japan and opened up the Japanese port. Only 40 years since then, Japan defeated the largest nation in the world at that time. And Japan fought the second war with China. And Japan was eventually defeated by the United States. Why Japan was fighting that type of war? Japan was a rising power rising very, very rapidly. Therefore, existing power of China and emerging power of the United States. They defeated Japan. And since the end of the Second World War, Japan aligned itself to the United States thanks to the same governance, the plural democracy, respect of human rights, and all sorts of things. The period since 1972, when Japan normalized relations with, with China, and the time when China surpassed Japan in terms of GDP, 19, I mean, 2010. That 40 years, the most, most, most comfortable years for Japan. Japan was by far the second largest, I mean, by far uh, bigger than China second largest economy of the world. So 40 years, that never will come back. This year, as I said, the, from 2010 to, to 2050, uh, when Xi Jinping talks about Chinese history, 40 years is going to be very, very important here, not just for us, but for you as well, because we all know that China will grow and the United States might sort of decline its leadership. Question we are facing up with, that is a question I would like to talk to you. That, that's the reason why I say that there's going to be a need for us to consult each other, countries in the region, in particular Japan, Korea, Australia, ASEAN, India. I'm not saying that we can contain China. I'm not saying that we can sort of, uh, you know, uh, introduce second 
Cold War, because there's one thing very, very different. That is, in the event of Cold War, first Cold War with the Soviet Union, we were economically independent. We don't count on Soviet economy at all. But today, second Cold War won't happen. Why? Because we are so interdependent. China cannot survive alone. Then we cannot survive without China. 1.3 billion market. So it's very clear in my mind. The question into the future is we will make sure that we can cope with China in terms of security. And for that, we need the United States. You wouldn't like us to go much militaristic way. I think I have a strong feeling that Japan needs to expand its security role, but under US-Japan Security Treaty. I do hope that this security treaty between Japan and the United States will be supported by certain other measures as well, like the uh, confidence building measures in the region. I think for that soft, soft, soft uh, security cooperation, we need to involve China. We need to involve China. And again, we need to be talking about how to expand partnerships, economic partnerships in the region. I am the person who started Japan's free trade agreement with Singapore in year 2000. And now Japan is sort of uh, in, 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 in the leadership role in uh, the TPP exercises and also Japan is promoting to expand RCEP. I have a strong feeling that we have, we should have China in mind uh, into the future for the sake of creating partnerships with them. So TPP, RCEP, RCEP needs to be established as soon as possible. TPP, RCEP needs to be creating some type of partnership. And again, China needs to be brought in in the international orbit for the supply chain as well. The, we need to talk about the question of infrastructures. I mean, it's good to have many infrastructure projects, but the question is that that needs to be based upon international standard. Cannot be the political influence winning activities. It will have to be. That's the reason why Japan, the Japanese Prime Minister agreed upon uh, 52 projects, joint project with China in the third country. The meaning of it is Japan can be working jointly with China in order to establish infrastructures based upon international standard. So this type of activities would be very, very needed into the future. The main thing, main element is, let us not be too naive. Let us be very seriously cope with Chinese threat, if there is any, into the future. But at the same time, try to change China in terms of the active, in terms of the uh, behavior, behavior on the part of China. Uh, that's a long-term issue. This is the issue which we need to be debating with uh, Indonesia, with you know Thailand, Singapore, Vietnam, and others in the region. But yet, much more acute issue is Korea, North Korea. The, uh, as we all know, North Korea has more or less acquired nuclear weapon, and Japan is uh, in a quite vulnerable position. Why? Because if you, again, look back at the history, <laughs> we fought three wars at least over the peninsula, Korean peninsula. I mean, we did not fight with Koreans, but yet we fought with China. The Korean peninsula as the battlefield, China and also Russia and the U.S. as well, to some extent, so which shows that how serious we are in terms of security interests of Korean Peninsula. Today, 
if North Korea what so decided to use a nuclear weapon, Japan becomes all of a sudden very vulnerable. If they so decided not to use it for their people, China is said to be their supporter. Therefore, Japan houses US base in Japan. So Japan may be the right target for them. Therefore, we have all the reasons to be very serious about the, uh, the uh, uh, resolution of the uh, North Korean nuclear issue. Uh, we have, I mean, I was uh, involved from the very first moment of this no North Korean nuclear issue. I was the one who received CIA briefing in 1989 that North Korea is developing nuclear, military nuclear activities, 80, 1989. And in 1994, there was the first nuclear crisis, North Korean nuclear crisis. I was the one who prepared for contingency plan. We expected some type of war to take place in 1994, but luckily the United States under the leadership of former President Carter uh, started negotiations with North Korea, concluding negotiations in which we provided two nuclear uh, light water reactors which produces less plutonium. We have thought at that time, 1994, that yeah, North Korea nuclear issue is over, but it did not, it not end. Uh, we, uh, the Japanese Prime Minister, Koizumi, visited North Korea 2002. I prepared for his trip to North Korea, uh, utilizing for one whole year. Secreted, secretly negotiating with, with North Korea without uh, uh, only five people, uh, without less, less of five, five people know. It was very tough negotiation. I spent about 25, no, 28 sessions over weekends with North Korean military general negotiating the future relationship between Japan and North Korea, and also the question of abductees, uh, meaning that 20, 28 times over one year, meaning that each uh, weekend, two weekends in a month, uh, I secretly left my house and uh, went to Darian and had about 10 hours of very tough negotiations uh, returns to Japan without being noticed. Very exciting, but yet very scary. Very scary thing. And I all the time reported to the Japanese Prime Minister on Friday and Monday. Because before we negotiated, I had gone to the Prime Minister's office to explain what to do. And uh, when I finished negotiation, came back at that time. There are a couple of key questions. I mean, people may say, well, that negotiation did not success, succeed very much, but yet you cannot deny the fact that five abductees returned to Japan, survive, and they promised, North Korea promised, that they make thorough research in relation to those abductees. I remember Kim Jong-il in front of me stated that, yes, I'm sorry, this is North Korea who committed this crime. And again, in the form of Pyongyang Declaration, we have set the roadmap for the, the uh, future of Japan-North Korea relationship. And, I mean, people, not very many people know this, but yet we are the ones who established what we call six-party talks. Why? Because we had strong interest in security issues of the Korean Peninsula. It's not just abduction. It is the whole peace and stability of the Korean Peninsula Japan needs to pay due attention to. So uh, the other day I was visited by one of the negotiators of the United States regarding the question of uh, North Korean nuclear development. I said to him, I have a strong feeling that the issue can be resolved. But there are a couple of must things. First, you must establish trust. 
trust. I mean, North Korea is rotten government, but yet every diplomatic negotiation starts from the individual encounters. I mean, it, when you cannot, I mean, therefore trust is one of the key things in every negotiation. Therefore, I said to my American colleagues, you must establish trust. And two, you must work for the roadmap. Uh, the current difference between the United States and North Korea regarding the denuclearization of Korean Peninsula, America uh, at the earlier days said that at one go, denuclearization at one go. North Korea said no way. I mean, I, I can say no way. Because once they decided to get rid of nuclear weapon at one go, it's desirable for us, but if they were to get rid of them at one go, they become all of a sudden vulnerable. They may feel that they will be targeted to the attack from outside, as Libya, as Iraq in the past. Therefore, this is bound to be step by step. This is bound to be step by step approach. And I think America was prepared to do it in Vietnam in February meeting. But North Korea only showed first step, not second, third, fourth, or whatever step needed for that. America demanded all the steps to the denuclearization. So the question is creating roadmap both for denuclearization and establishment of peace regime. If one is very serious to make one, they can do it. But for them uh, to do it, there would have to be working level negotiations. I can't think that Trump and Kim Jong-un sitting together <laughs> draw a roadmap for that very technical issues. So it is extremely important for them to de designate the negotiation team and to start real negotiations. For that matter, I welcome the encounter between President Trump and Kim Jong-un, which took place a few days ago at Panmunjom, because there was only one agreement there agreement is let us start working level consultation. So very, very strong progress, I should imagine. But the whole question is how successful this working level question will be, negotiation will be. This will be a long term process. I must say this must be a long term process. But yet I think we should manage we should manage the uh, process of denuclearization. And by managing this process, I mean, so far, North Korea hasn't gone beyond uh, uh, before, uh, you know, the uh, two years ago when they stopped, uh, uh, stopped nuclear testing, missile testing, and so on. This is itself is a good thing. We have currently moratorium on those. And again, you may have a different view, but yet China, Ro Russia, Japan, South Korea, United States, there is a unanimous agreement that we cannot let North Korea have nu nuclear weapon because it's so irresponsible for us to let North Korea have nuclear weapon. Therefore, e even China very definitively say we do not want North Korean nuclear weapon. Therefore, there is a, an absolute agreement in terms of objective. I think we better use this uh, unanimity. In the future, sort of security uh, venue, six-party talk may be one. I think into a long-term future, we would have to collaborate in all that type of soft security issue, non-proliferation, missile, the piracies and all sorts of things. And for that matter, I think ASEAN plays very significant role. ASEAN plays very significant role. Therefore, 
the whole question from now on is centering upon various different subject issues. Could we create much stronger partnership or not? Uh, having said that, I, uh, I finished my initial remarks. I thank you for your uh, quiet uh, listening to me. Thank you. Well, thank you, Tanaka-san. I think you have uh, given us a, a, a kind of a tour of the horizon of a development, a security development in our part of the world. And I think it is a Japanese view, but I think there are many parts of it that we have in common. Well, I would like to open the floor first uh, for questions and answers. And maybe I have a few for the first you know, team, and then I have follow up to the second and maybe the third. Uh, can you identify yourself, your name, and your affiliations? And, and, and I hope that yeah, it, could, it could be as short as possible. You first and then you the second. Can you uh, come forward to the, to the mic, please? Hi, guys. Hi, guys. Tanaka san, that was an uh, interesting speech. Uh, uh, East Asia is uh, relatively interesting in dynamics between Japan, South Korea, North Korea, and China, and also United States uh, at the present. Uh, however, uh, in terms of traditional security, uh, military deterrence, uh, and nuclear weapons, and etc., it's in my opinion, is uh, even though it's in, it's on the rise nowadays, it's already a bit outdated because it's 2000, 2019 and we are in the era of economic cooperation. So maybe instead of worrying about military or hard uh, hard diplomacy stuff, why don't Japan focus on more soft diplomacy stuff like in economic co cooperation or maybe uh, cultural diplomacy like? Uh, two weeks ago, we have Enichi sign here. It's a form of cultural diplomacy, mm -hmm. and it's uh, in its itself. Japan has a very strong weapon in cultural diplomacy because Japanese pop culture is on the rise everywhere in the world, uh, besides from uh, the South Korean uh, popular culture. So instead of hard uh, hard diplomacy, soft diplomacy might be the key for uh, for solving the security in Asia. Maybe not the the one solution for all, but it, ma it might be a significant a key. However, uh, this, is my uh, this is my second question. Uh, it has drawbacks because in the past five years, there's a rising of ultra-nationalist uh, parties and groups in either South Korea and Japan itself that really don't want any, uh, don't want a warm, Relationship between the uh, between the countries, respectively. Even uh, the ultranationalist uh, groups in Japan hates all the South Korea, China, North Korea, North Korea, and America itself. The, uh, the United States, the United States Navy, Navy base in uh, Okinawa is still on the hot. So uh, maybe it's uh, is there any uh, significant correlation between the rising of the ultranationalist groups? and the Japanese perspective itself in the security in East Asia. Thank you. Can you identify yourself? Oh, yeah. Uh, Rio from Universitas Ponegoro, Semarang. Oh, from, yeah. from Arigato gozaimashita. From Central Java. Okay. And second one? Arigato gozaimashita for your very thought-provoking uh, presentation. I am Iskandar Hadrianto, representing uh, myself. Uh, as a private consultant. Uh, I have uh, two, three questions. First, is there any indication that uh, the, the Prime Minister's uh, maneuver now is uh, try to revisit the Yoshida doctrine vis-a-vis -vis, uh, the relationship uh, with the United States and uh, taking into consideration uh, the situation in the Southeast Asia, especially the nuclearization? You mentioned quite uh, right when uh, you have a proposal of the six parties dialogues in trying to inject new dimension in the denuclearization of this area. Even there is a trajectory that I heard that Japanese now, uh, the pr your prime minister nowadays is uh, having such kind of uh, intention to have a dialogue not only with North Korea but also with Iran. 
maybe you can explore it further. And uh, my second question is about uh, the, the last uh, summit of Japan and uh, the United States, that there is such kind of uh, very delicate issues regarding the 25% of uh, reducing uh, uh, duties for the uh, car, not only passengers but also transport, that is going to be imposed or already to be imposed by Mr. Trump, and also in the agricultural sector, which is also important for Japan, that you are trying to alleviate uh, or try to propose the 18, 18, around 18 percent, I think, yeah? one eight percent uh, with the United States. And uh, I think that's more than enough. <laughs> Arigato. Okay. Uh, maybe one more. Yes, please. For you. Yeah. 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 It's on. Yeah. Good morning, Tanaka-san. Uh, thank you for your uh, lecture. My name is uh, Gibran Drajat, and I'm a lecturer of, uh, President of International Relations Study Program at President University. Um, what is interesting about your lecture is that you stated that U.S. is becoming unreliable and unworthy, under, uh, untrustworthy, right, under President Trump. And this, when, when you said that, one of the things that really applicable to this instance, as you already explained also, is the situation in North Korea, right? Um, President Trump has a habit of uh, swinging by his mood, wherein he sets a conciliator, no, he sets a very threatening tone in the beginning of his term to North Korea using language like fire and fury to what is now a very excessively conciliatory tone with North Korea. So I was wondering, does Japan have any foreign or defense strategy in long term to respond to this unpredictability <laughs> and untrustworthiness. Uh, because uh, remember last month before the G20, uh, Trump and Shinzo Abe had this agreement on how to collectively deal with uh, Kim Jong-un, wherein Trump basically stated, well, that's not the problem for the United States anymore and it doesn't violate, <laughs> the, the missile test doesn't violate UN uh, Council, Security Council resolution, right? And my second question is that you mentioned that these high-level talks between Trump and Kim Jong-un should be delegated or designated to lower officials, to the officials of both states. Uh, from the perspective of the U.S., Trump also has a habit of overstepping uh, the, advice of his advice, the advice of his officials, right? Uh, John Bolton and Mike Pompeo and all that. So how can we, what are the strategies how can we manage to delegate this to lower officials if the head of state of the United States continues to overstep his own officials? Okay, thank you. Yeah, very good question. I will maybe refer to you now, and then we can get a second round. Please. Thanks very much. Uh, all very intelligent questions. Thank you for the uh, questions. Uh, the first question to do with uh, the, uh, uh, how shall I say, for Japan, it is very necessary to talk about the economic cooperation, the cultural cooperation, and other soft powers, soft powers. Yes, indeed, it is very necessary for Japan to be doing it. Uh, the reason why Japan proposed the concept or vision of uh, the uh, Indo-Pacific. Uh, that is very much to do with a needy economic cooperation and also cultural and uh, uh, you know soft cooperation uh, by expanding the scope and by introducing uh, the basic disciplines such as open, transparent, rule-based, and all sorts of things. Therefore, given the fact that Japan cannot be a military power, Japan, what Japan can use uh, is to let American might use in a constructive way by 
sort of by uh, expanding the security uh, and uh, alliance relationship. Abe san has been doing it uh, well, in a sense, by uh, becoming a golfing partner, by becoming uh, a very serious entertainer uh, for Trump. The remaining question is how he will be able to change the attitude on the part of uh, President Trump. As I said, we would like Trump to consider long-term interest of the United States alongside with their short term. So uh, probably in the main theater of economic cooperation, Japan will be doing that as well. Uh, the trade uh, negotiation between Japan and the United States, uh, that's going to be difficult because there are two key questions as you said, that one is agriculture, the, the other one is, is uh, uh, automobile. Uh, I am a real expert, I am a real expert on the US-Japan uh, trade negotiations. And again, I have uh, gone through all this period of time when America all the time put their pressure at the highest level. But when we made agreement, uh, you know, not, which does not involve too much concession on the part of Japan, they declare victory. Even when they demanded this and we agreed upon this, they say, this is a great, great victory of the United States. Do you know why? Because when you talk about trade imbalance, it cannot be dealt by tariff or market opening up measures. What counts most is macroeconomic policy. What counts more is America needs to save more in order to reduce their importation. Since America is such a consumption-oriented society, they buy things. They cannot produce a lot of things. Therefore, they import. So even in relation to China, there is going to be a huge trade war as we experience. And there is going to be, undoubtedly, there is going to be an agreement. Most of people say that, eh, no, 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 there is no agreement between China and the United States. But I think there is going to be an agreement. Why? Because transaction can become transaction only when there is an agreement. Therefore, Mr. Trump, <laughs> at, you know, at most appropriate time for his, uh, for his uh, the election strategy, uh, I'm sure he agrees. Uh, the other question, the question of Iran, I suppose. The, uh, Prime Minister Abe, by the way, I am not very enthusiastic about his speech of to have a uh, meeting with uh, Kim Jong-un without having any uh, preconditions. Uh, normal diplomacy is that in order for a president, prime minister to meet with someone uh, with whom no diplomatic relations exist. There is a need for very precise preparation before making uh, it happen. Uh, I'm not entirely sure if there has been a lot of preparation work uh, already done. I am not entirely sure, because I'm not in the government, I don't know. Uh, I am hoping that there is going to be a meeting end of the day, uh, but it's not likely to happen soon. Question of Iran. Uh, he visited Iran uh, in order to sort of bridge the difference between the United States and Iran. We have been doing it. It's, this is not the first time. We have been doing this for ages because if you look at Japanese interest, Japanese interest may, is not to see a war between Iran and the United States. It's not Japanese interest to see the Strait of Holmes to be closed. Because 80% of our oil is coming through this Strait 
uh, of Hol Holmes. Therefore, we don't want that confrontation between uh, United States and Iran. You may not know this, but the origin of uh, settlement of Iran nuclear deal was started in the G7 process in 2004. At that time, Mr. Bolton was the G7 representative in charge of non-proliferation. He was under secretary of uh, state in charge of non-proliferation. I was representing Japan for political matters in G7. And Europeans came to me asking that they would like to make negotiation with Iran. Therefore, Mr. Tanaka, please, since Japan and the United States is such a good, in such a good relationship, please make sure that the United States would agree to European negotiation to Iran. Uh, Bolton is such a fundamentalist. He said, no way, said, over my dead body. I cannot kill him, but yet I decided sort of uh, by step him and asked my good friend of mine who was superior to uh, Bolton, Richard Armitage, who, is, who was Deputy Secretary of State, and Secretary of State was uh, uh, Mr. Powell. And they are said to be uh, moderate regarding Iran. They agreed to the negotiation by Europeans to uh, Iran. So that was the beginning of, of the negotiated settlement. But Trump all of a sudden decided to leave from uh, the Iran agreement. That is a unilateral move. We don't like this. You may say that, you may think that Japan, United States, such a uh, good uh, ally, therefore Japan listens to United States 100%. No way. We feel that we would like to see the constructive negotiation reopen between, uh, between Iran and uh, United States. That's the reason why. Uh, as uh, the Prime Minister of Japan, he uh, went to Iran to straight, I mean, to give Iran the message. We do want to uh, have negotiation instead of Iran escalating their activities to violate the existing uh, agreement. The same thing would apply to the United States. The United States needs to change their attitude as well. Uh, the, uh, uh, the last question to do with the uh, Japanese foreign defense uh, strategy. Uh, yes, I said that there is a need for working level meeting. Without working level meeting, there is no end to the question of nuclear denuclearization in North Korea. I mean, do, don't you think that this is very scary? The Trump uh, using uh, his tweet saying that I would like to meet with Kim Jong-un uh, over Panmunjom, and that happens the following day. It has a merit, no question about it. Uh, no president in the past has ever done it. But we must consider that voice, words of president is very, very heavy. Very, very heavy. And this time it was only to do with the arrangement of the meeting. It cannot be something more substantive, such as how to restrict missiles, how to restrict nuclear weapon, and all sorts of things. For that, it is not possible for president to negotiate with North Korea from the very beginning. He is in a position to approve. The same thing happens between United States and China regarding trade war. The all those ministerial level people, the Treasury Secretary or USDR, they say that we are almost there. And they went to Trump and explained to him, Trump said, no. 
just not, you know, in addition to saying no, he put tariff, 20% on you know, such a broad based items. Chinese started thinking, well, it would have to be only the summit level which make things uh, agree agreeable. That's the reason why this time again the the uh, summit meeting took place in Osaka, and th there was an agreement that the uh, the uh, ministerial level meeting is going to be open. And as I said, there's going to be a solution. After several months, it may not be easy, but yet, but again, without all those working level meeting, there is no solution whatsoever. That's it. Yeah. Uh, then she said the first round. Now we, I open the second round. Rene, who else over there? And then the third one. If there's any, or, or you start first, Rene. Come to the point. Terima kasih, Pak Yusuf. Um, good morning, Chairman Tanaka. My name is Rene Patirajawani. I'm with the Center for Chinese Studies. I was um, trying to, to figure it out. You mentioned about the rise of Japan in your historical perspective. That was very bloody, fighting every big country in the world during that particular time. Do you also foresee that what the Chinese is doing now, the rise of China now, do have the same path like the Japanese by increasing their military capabilities, especially the maritime forces, which was not clearly for us what was the target and the purpose on having a mighty naval forces. So do you foresee that China is taking the same uh, route regarding to their rise? And who do you think that China will uh, have to fight uh, to maintain their rise. Japanese is very clear. When you start your, the, the rise of Japan, the main uh, enemy is the West by that time. Because you want to be in an equal footing with the developed nations. So do you also foresee that China also is doing the same exact ways as the Japanese has been doing by starting a trade war that, that has no end at all? It starts as a deficit, now it's a technological issue, now it's a mix-up. The second thing is, uh, <coughs> In your security perspective outlook, do you think that we are going back actually in a bipolar world instead of trying to expanding and deepening the multipolar uh, world to have a multilateralism uh, cooperation? The, the, the Korean Peninsula is exactly uh, and examples actually, how the U.S. is trying to solve the Korean Peninsula issues without consulting the other partners, uh, Japan, South Korea, for example. And if you see this is a bipolar disease that has been uh, rising, how are you going to maintain your security uh, defense treaty with the U.S. that you have been now been pushing by Washington to also have a, a burden sharing? Uh, 
to uh, finance the military uh, existence in Asia. Thank you. Thank you. you Go ahead. I'm sorry if I hear several questions at one time. I forget <laughs> the first question. So let me make the uh, brief uh, response to your question, twofold. One is the uh, question of uh, the uh, rise of China, rise of Japan, similar pattern or not. There are a couple of different things. The, when uh, there was a rise of Japan, it was very, very military. It's much propagandalish, it's imperialism. No question about that. Therefore, Japan was wanting to secure oil. Japan was wanting to secure resources. Therefore, very simple-minded in a sense. Uh, and that, that was the expression of Japanese own nationalism at that time. This time, China. China is operating in entirely different part uh, environment. One, United States is overwhelmingly big superpower in terms of economy, in terms of military capability. And Chinese know that it would take long time for them to surpass, <coughs> surpass United States. Therefore, I do think that Chinese ambitious level is a long range thing, not immediate, like Japanese sort of started doing, uh, you know, in an aggressive way in a short period of time. Uh, the third difference is, this is very important because we are operating in the world of globalization. In the world of people may say globalization has lots of negative elements. Globalization has created income disparity all over the world. But before income disparity, globalization has contributed the increase of economic growth all over the world, no question about it. As a result of it, each country cannot survive without having trade investment relationship with the rest of the world. Look at China. I mean, this trade war clearly shows by putting up tariff 25%, the United States firms and Chinese equally suffer a lot. Therefore, this strong, uh, strong uh, networks of interdependency will let each government rethink that continuation of this type of trade war for a long time will not be good. Uh, therefore, this is a different thing. I mean, different from the period of time Japan operated, Japan rose. This is very different. So it's in a sense, uh, uh, one of the key difference. Uh, those are probably uh, differences. The, uh, I think Ch Chinese, having said that, having said that, Chinese target, Chinese objective is indeed over long term, China probably wishes to create their, their own world, their own world. Therefore, their step is very, very deliberate. It's a, this is a try and, and error process. I mean, it's amazing. The, their expansion is not necessarily military. There is a military element as well in relation to South China Sea, East China Sea as well. But Currently, their method of expanding their political influence is through economic cooperation, through road and belt project. And they are learning in the process that the case of Sri Lanka, meaning that uh, a huge indebtedness to Sri Lanka and Chinese took over the management of the port and all sorts of things. That has created a kind of shock wave to the rest of the world. So objective is, is very clear in my mind. China wishes their own world. But given the fact that any country cannot survive without relying upon others, therefore, it would have to be long-term <coughs> undertakings on the part of China, gradually expand political influences through helping others to build 
uh, people may say it may not be bad, but yet the question still, this is an open question, what is the ultimate form of Chinese political influence? Would it be the, you know, would it be imposing the same governance system? We don't like it at all. Therefore, what is needed for us is to continue restrain on China, continue to make pressure on them so that China behave constructively. Uh, that uh, is my, my, my answer. What is your second question? <laughs> Forget about it. A burden sharing. Uh, I mean, security has got three dimensions. Security has got three dimensions. Hard security. Hard security. Japan, America, security alliance is a hard security. What Trump is saying that Japan should pay more for the stationing force stationing American force. Japan has been paying a lot. They are, I'm not entirely sure if we can pay more. If we pay more, we would have to pay the salary of American soldiers in Japan. That we won't do. <laughs> American, American soldiers, not Japanese. That is one dimension, hard security. Second, soft security. Soft security is the cooperation, security, in the field of security, we cooperate so that we can increase confidence in each other, such as visiting, I mean, military vessel visiting uh, respective ports, or cope with uh, piracies together, or the, um, the non-proliferation of mass destruction, all sorts of things. It has nothing to do with the, uh, you know, the uh, combats with each other. It's more to do with uh, the uh, betterment of security environment. Third dimension is diplomacy. People often forget, forgetting about this third element. In order to enhance security environment, we need diplomacy. The North Korean issue, American efforts to negotiate with North Korea to settle uh, nuclear question, that is diplomatic venture. Uh, Trump used maximum threat, maximum pressure before starting negotiation, but yet the objective of America for this is to settle nuclear weapon thing by negotiation. That's good. The question of China, this is an important question because could we resolve the rivalry between United States and China by diplomacy? That's going to be asked into the future. There is a question mark here because both countries, ultra big nations, and they both are hegemon. So uh, could, could they set through things by making compromise? I don't know. I don't know. That is a subject which we would be debating into the future. Huh? Okay. Uh, you, your second one, please come forward. Can you identify yourself? Terima kasih, Pak Yusuf. Good morning, Mr. Tanaka. My name is Andre. I'm research assistant for to the governor of Lemhanas, uh, General Agus Vijoya. Uh, National Resilience Institute of the Republic of Indonesia. Uh, my question is, what is Japan's perspective on the recent rapprochement between North Korea and South Korea? Uh, does Japan only see it as a positive thing for East Asian security? Um, or or does it bring some concern to Japan that it could be a potential threat for Japanese security, raising an issue of two Koreas might unite against Japanese interests? Thank you. Thank you. 
this is uh, often asked question, uh, and uh, all the time I say, since it hasn't happened, <laughs> I have no answer to it. <laughs> but uh, let me say this: uh, there are issues in, in international relations, and unification of one. I mean, one uh, nation, nations is extremely important concept. It's extremely important concept. Therefore, if North and South Korea amicably, by negotiation, without war, if they were united, Japan is in a position to support by all means. And that applies to the rest of the world. This unification of same people is extremely important. That is a value. Therefore, there is no reason why Japan should not report, should not support that. Japan is in a position to provide help in terms of funding, funding, because Japan did provide funding to uh, South Korea when we normalized relationship. Same thing would apply to North Korea uh, before unification and when un united I'm sure Japan will provide very substantive financial cooperation to them. You, s you put your finger in the right spot meaning would it not become a threat to Japan? It would. It would, because of the past history and also thing. But that is very, very crucial. I mean, when you talk about this uh, unification process and also every country has got different interest. It's a superb concept, the, the unification, but China has got its interest. China would, would not like to the uni unified Korea to be in the camp of America. Russia may have different interests. And those two countries having order, and again, if you look at Chinese uh, uh, border, that's a poorer, nation, poorer part of China. And the key question of Chinese development is disparity among the regions. And this uh, region uh, adjacent to the border of North Korea is poorer nation. Therefore, they would like to consider massive investment there alongside with North Korea. Therefore, China, I'm sure, if united, would like to take a much stronger initiative to make sure that the political influence will be, will be, uh, will be uh, sort of accepted by United Korea. Japan would be the, doing the same thing. And Russia would be the same thing and America would be the same thing. That's the reason why there would have to be international format for foreseeing that stability of Korean Peninsula will come about. And again, given the fact that s North Korea is about 150th of South Korea in terms of economic scale, therefore massive funding massive development efforts would be needed on the part of North Korea. The same thing happened between uh, West and East Germany because the East Germany was so poor than, uh, than, uh, than West that for, for a long period of time the East uh, part of Germany has been subsidized. The same thing would happen to this question. So given the fact that they require international help for the, you know, viable unification, uh, there shouldn't be any sort of rivalry uh, regarding the future of uh, uh, the uh, Korea as a whole. And as time goes by, people become mature. Therefore, there is no such thing like dispute. Thank you. Uh, 
We have another 10 minutes. So anybody else who feels very strongly to ask questions, we have a, a very good actually expose of Japanese thinking and the nuances that might be a little bit you know, different than our attitudes or uh, perception. But at the same time, in, in general, I think we have the same line of thinking. Now, if there are others who really feel, why, why do you, Milan, why do you ask questions from CSIS? Come on. But Yusuf really likes to put me on a very tight spot, and <laughs> I think I'm guilty in this. So, thank you, Pak Yusuf, and thank you, Patanaka. My name is Gilang Kembara. I'm a researcher here at CSIS, and from your presentation and speech just earlier, I do see that a lot of your viewpoints are very fair and also uh, objective in its way to um, trying to quantify or uh, trying to uh, make sense on the issue, security issues in, in Asia. Um, I had a lot of ideas in my mind, but I just can't put it into one specific question to hand it out to you. Um, elegantly, if I, may, if I may say, but one thing that I had in my mind was on the issue of North Korea and the two things that you said about Jap Japan having a very strong interest within the peninsula and that your um, non-enthusiastic, uh, I suppose, feeling on Prime Minister Abe meeting Kim Jong-un without any precondition, if I'm not mistaken. And when it comes to North Korea, I can't help to think, but um, some of the things that we have taken into account may have only been through the viewpoint of the United States and its allies and that we may be a bit guilty to try not to try take the viewpoint of Pyongyang itself but then again I ask myself what is the viewpoint of Pyongyang because the viewpoint of North Korea is very obscure and them itself being the hermit kingdom doesn't publicly open a lot of things. But there's one thing that I can, I think, pinpoint, which is, I think, historical perspective, in a way that one, of, one, of the, one historical perspective being any deal being struck with North Korea, striking the deal is somewhat successful. But making the deal stick is the one that is the tricky part. So you have issues, say, within the United States of a change in the Congress um, disagreeing to continuing with sort of like an agreed framework, the ones that we had in the 90, 90, 1994, perhaps, and then as well in 2005. And then you have the hawkish within Seoul, that the conservatives that want to assert their strong leadership. Perhaps they, they long for the days of Kim Dae-jung and perhaps the long, you know, the reigning of the, the first president, Singman Rees, or something like that. So I was just wondering if there is any sort of niche or a caveat or an entry point where a group of more open minded or progressive people can try to take into account all the holistic viewpoint of not just the allies but also North Korea in this sense and try to make out a very long-term way of, of trying to strike a deal with them because just like in 1953 in my in my mind 1953 when the North the North the Korean War was over the ones who struck the deal in interestingly was the America and North Korea but not South Korea. And from my perspective also at that point, it's because South Korea was <laughs> led by a madman. I, I, I hope I'm not offending any South Korean here, but President Sing Win Rhee was a madman back in the day. But So maybe a grouping of an Asian sort of wise political leaders to try to work out this sort of differences and point out the holistic viewpoint for the long run. I'm sorry if it takes quite a long question. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I think your point has got very uh, many important sub points as well. Therefore, I try to address all those uh, important points. Uh, first, uh, let us uh, try to find out what is the objective, main objective on the part of North Korea. 
for doing all this. Uh, more or less, they are doing the same thing. They are showing that they, uh, they have capability, nuclear capability, or they will have capability in all sorts of things. And by showing that possibility, they try to get support from the West. And basic concept has not changed. Basic concept meaning, in order for their survival, they would like to use nuclear weapon. Either possibility of usage of nuclear weapon or possibility of getting rid of nuclear weapon. And this man, Kim Jong-un, fairly young, 33 or 34, and he has lived in the foreign countries. And he knows what is taking place beyond the border of North Korea. And he feels that he and his country cannot survive without foreign support. Therefore, the young leader, Kim Jong-un's basic objective is to use nuclear capability not for the usage of it, but for the gaining of support from the rest of the world. That's the reason why he made general statement. <coughs> yes, North Korea is committed to the denuclearization of Korean Peninsula, but at the same time he says that is conditional to the establishment of permanent peace regime. Therefore, in order to create pa permanent pe peace regime, there are lots of things like normalization and all sorts of things. My point is this can come true. This, is, this will happen. But it doesn't mean that the, we can resolve this question of uh, uh, North Korean nuclear, uh, nuclear capability for good. <laughs> As I said, it's going to be a long-term process because all the time, North Korea will probably show that they may have something else type thing. Therefore, we have to, we have to be realistic. It's going to be a long-term process. Our buy is that the situation is getting better than getting worse. So that, that is, that is uh, where we are. One of the other important points, as you say, depending upon specific government in various countries, the outcome may change. And this is going to be more so into the future. I mean, I forgot to uh, mention this. Someone asked me that uh, this is a populistic world. I mean, everywhere, even this country, uh, the government is relying upon, I mean, leaders are relying upon what we call public sentiment. <coughs> they are less uh, entertaining professional viewpoints. The America is full of nonsense, but yet nonsense is something for the people, in particular segment of people. That's the reason why Trump has got more than 40% support. So in England, I spent six years altogether in England. The recovery of Britain is very much based upon their entry into European Union. And everyone knows this because of the European Union. Indeed, the uh, you know, British economy has come back. But now Britain is trying to leave it. Nonsense, sheer nonsense. But yet people make judgment, and the policy is based upon people's judgment. Such a said at one time, that is irresponsible because political party is being selected by the vote of people, and political party and government would have to be responsible for it. And people don't know everything. Therefore, by having na national voting for European Union, it's nonsense because it's so, such a complex issue. How could people make judgment on all small details type of thing? So, but yet this is taking place every country and even in Japan. Someone talked about 
Japan's nationalistic sentiment and the eventual confrontation or eventual friction with South Korea. South Korea is known for a very strong anti-Japanese sentiment if set fire. That is very much to do with the practice in the history. So, uh, but now Japan is, to be very honest, more nationalistic than before. Because Japan is fed up with, you know, all the time of making apologies, making apologies. 75 years since the end of the war, Japan feel that Japan has been doing the right thing, but still, you know, the past question of the past is being used for some excuses for attacking Japan. So we are fed up with it. And the current government undoubtedly is more nationalistic, conservative government than before. And I think it's natural, but yet that needs to be controlled. That needs to be controlled. Uh, in America, as I said, in this country, and, and I was in the Philippines, and Thailand, both of the countries, this question of nationalism. Nationalism, by definition, diffuses much stronger, deeper international cooperation. Therefore, I would like to see wise men like uh, Yusuf will play a significant role because our most significant role is to make sure that people can make sound judgment. I, I, I am not able to influence my government, but yet I may be able to influence the people by making straightforward argument. That is quite important. Therefore, for you know, coming, coming, uh, coming days and uh, years, uh, this is going to be uh, become, becoming more and, more and more difficult. It's, there are so many, I mean, we know that this is a sensible thing, but it's not, but often sensible, unsensible thing happens. And question of North Korea, indeed. North Korea issue is easy to be used for the domestic purpose. In America, in South Korea, in Japan as well. That is going to be quite scary. Thank you. I think uh, we uh, have uh, exactly consumed our one and a half hour. And I would like, first of course, to thank Tanaka-san about his forthrightness of explaining the nuances that we also should know about Japan's policy on security. Because we don't have enough of that. And that's why we are looking forward in the future to cooperate much more closely together so that we have that aspect, that point of view, uh, I think, well taken in our judgment of what our foreign policy and security policy should be. Well, thank you and give him a big hand. Uh, thank you, Mr. Hitoshi Tanaka and Mr. Yusuf Wanandi. Ladies and gentlemen, we have come to the end of our event. On behalf of CSIS, I would like to thank you for your attendance and hope to see you at the next CSIS lecture series. Thank you.